Okay, so this is week one of inquiry meditation. And uh, first we can ask the question, what is inquiry? That's a question that we can just sit with. What's funny is I'm gonna be talking a lot <laughs> uh, versus just sitting with a question, but um, you can always just sit with a question and that's it, you know, and see what happens. But I found that having a little bit of orientation to what this practice is and how to go about it can help make it uh, more fruitful, more meaningful, deeper. At Buddhist Geeks, we uh, define this way of meditating, one of the six ways of meditating, as uh, the practice of using a question as a prompt for discovery. I really quite like that as a succinct, succinct definition. Really good. We could just stop there. I'll say what's really interesting <laughs> that we have actual data on this. It's been a while, like maybe a year or so, in surveying the community at that time out of the six ways of meditating. Inquiry uh, was the least popular way of meditating in terms of like interest and also the least understood or the, the least experienced. So it kind of makes sense. It's like, if I don't know what that is, how can, you know, I might not be that interested in it. <laughs> um, but it's indispensable for me. I mean, that's, we list it as one of the six ways of meditating. So it's important enough at Buddhist Geeks to say this is, there could be more than six ways, but it's one of the most important ways of meditating. And I use it all the time, both like formally, but also intuitively kind of like Roka. If you've read Roka, um, Letters to a Young Poet, Live the Question, that kind of thing that happens all the time. So we're going to explore a little bit about what it is so we can get a little bit more clear on this. And also I'm hoping to share this talk with other people who may be sitting back and saying, I don't know about this. And maybe this will be a little clear and invite people into exploring this way of meditating. So I wanted to mention Kenneth Folk, uh, who's a really wonderful teacher and also, um, yeah, one of the originators, pioneers of our of social meditation. And he has something called the three speed transmission, three gears, as he's describing in this metaphor of meditating, and each gear is going deeper. And so really the way he will describe it is starting with the last gear, third gear, like just go for that. And if you can't, you go to second gear. And if you can't do that one, you go to first gear. First gear is, uh, in his words, balancing investigation and concentration. So this is classic Buddhism. Um, and it can take so many different forms across the lineages and, and flavors. And in that gear, you know, you're usually dealing with very specific instructions. Here's what to do. Here are the steps. Here's what you might experience. Here's how to navigate X, Y, Z obstacles and here are the results so it's it's really really useful um it's a great place to start it's very clear in that sense it's eliminating a lot of questions questions will still arise inevitably in, in practice but you start off with very clear answers and direction the second gear he says is who am i so now we have a question who knows this experience and I haven't asked Kenneth this, but I'm assuming he would extend this to a lot more questions. So it's interesting that for Kenneth here, the second gear is a deeper, a deeper way of, of meditating in that, in that sense. Um, the third gear is just let it be. So this is kind of, you see this in different formats, no meditation, just sitting, uh, presence, shikantaza, those kinds of things, non-dual. Um, so... <laughs> You know, to inquire means really to let go of the need for an answer. Now, there's more to this, but like this is a starting point of I have to be willing to ask the question. And I'm not going to ask the question if I feel like, um, or I won't sit with the question if I need the answer. I might ask it once and like, let's get on with it. Right. But inquiry is really about sitting with that question just like we would sit with anything in meditation. What is it like to sit with a question over a longer duration in a session and in life? Um, so first, it's really good to find out how we orient to inquiry and, and, and sitting with the question. So we can kind of see what resistance, obstacles might arise to us uh, engaging the practice. So first is like, I have an answer. I already got an answer. Why am I gonna ask? <laughs> and I think all this applies to all of us in different ways at different times. So this isn't setting up question good, answers bad. It's just like if inquiry is using a, uh, a question for a prompt for discovery, 
we have to kind of first loosen up around our relationship to answers. So yeah, it'd be why bother asking the question? Let's get on with it. Let's do whatever that answer is or be whatever that answer is. The other option really that comes up a lot is I don't have an answer. And out of that not having an answer, I'm not going to answer the question, which sounds kind of interesting, but that can happen like out of confusion, feeling stuck in confusion. And um, even in resignation, you know, kind of like a giving up, like that can happen too. We just, oh, forget it, right? That's, so that can be difficult. Or we might say it's, it's better to do something. Like I don't have an answer, but the way to get there is not a question, but it's to, to do something. And again, referencing Kenneth Folk, that first gear is about doing something. So that is an option. And I like how, I like the gear metaphor because it says wherever we're at in this moment, let's shift to something that'll be most helpful. So we have six ways of meditating. So inquiry is not the way to meditate. You might be needing another way of, of meditating or another gear, et cetera. But if we're approaching inquiry and we're habitually avoiding sitting with the question because of that, then that's really interesting to explore. What does that feel like, you know, in our presence, in our body to um, avoid or resist sitting with a question and what might be missing out in terms of the richness of our experience and, and, and the wisdom that can arise out of sitting with a question. And of course, there are a lot of answers out there, right? I mean, Buddhism is filled with a lot of answers for us. I mean, and let alone other traditions. Um, so every teaching, every practice gives a lot of answers, even if those answers are trying to point beyond answers themselves, we can still sit with them and say, ah, okay, here's, here's something. I got this. So first, if we're going to discover anything into the mystery of being via a question, it's really good to feel into where we're at in any given moment with sitting with the question. One, is this the right meditation for me at this time? Intuitively, how can I feel into that? Um, uh, and then if it is, are there any resistances coming up that, that would be helpful to work with so that way I can relax into that question or that will be the practice is sitting with the question and feeling into those resistances, obstacles, hesitation, et cetera. So in that sense, I think it takes a lot of courage to sit in inquiry, courage to ask the question, courage to listen in presence, courage to allow responses, and then even courage to trust, you know, the space, trust being, trust sitting with that question. Now, I'm always, a, my personal experience and belief is that courage isn't necessarily something we first have to muster up. It's, it's, it's cultivated in this practice. We find our courage too in doing the practice. Um, so, some of what I want to explore here in this talk um, a little further is definitely about how to practice inquiry, like the approach I've found useful. And I know there's a lot of approaches out there uh, to doing this. So this is just kind of one way of doing it. We will work with a question in social meditation. Today, that will be what is awakening. And I'll share why I think that's a great place to start in terms of like a 10 week training. Really, I would say sit with whatever question is most relevant. That's what I try to go for, like, especially like one on one in private sessions. N zero agenda with the question. That's the point. <laughs> it's like, what question is really palpably in whatever embodied sense we have most relevant, but here we're doing kind of like a curriculum a bit. So we're starting with having a starting place. Uh, I want to first start with a couple other bit of conceptual bits for framing here to kind of just clarify what we're exploring. There is a term that's really a way of practicing called self-inquiry. And so you all might have already been familiar with that. I'm sure you are, whether you know that term or not. Um, but um, this is generally refers to investigating self or identity with the self or I. And for example, here's Wikipedia talking about this, referencing Ramana Maharshi, who is one of the most well-known teachers of self-inquiry. It says, it's, it is the constant attention to the inner awareness of I or I am recommended by Ramana Maharshi as the most efficient and direct way of discovering the unreality of the I thought. So we're not limited to one. It doesn't even necessarily imply that there's a question to sit with. It's an investigation. There are questions used like, who am I? Um, but 
uh, that's very specific. And we're a bit broader here. So we're talking about a way of meditating, which means lots of different questions. And very specifically, we mean sitting uh, and, and using a question for that prompt of discovery. Okay. Uh, Adyashante uh, is also well known for the practice of self inquiry. I want to share a quote from him Meditative self inquiry is the art of asking a spiritually powerful question. I like that definition as well. And a question that is spiritually powerful always points us back to ourselves because the most important thing that leads to spiritual awakening is to discover who and what we are, to wake up from this dream state, this trance state of identification with ego. And for this awakening to occur, there needs to be some transformative energy that can flash into consciousness. It needs to be an energy that is actually powerful enough to awaken consciousness out of its trance of separateness into the truth of our being. Inquiry is an active engagement with our own experience that can cultivate this flash of spiritual insight. So a few things that are here relevant for us in this way of meditating is that definition, you know, the, a spiritually powerful question, an active engagement that can naturally spontaneously lead to insight or responses. I would say still in this definition, it's applying that in a very, in a much more specific way, which is totally great. But I'm still like, when you look at the questions that uh, listed out for this training, we can go further than that. So it's not, we can inquire, not just back at ourselves, but into the world as well, into we, into it. So, you know, what's, what's uh, referenced here by Ramana Maharshi and Adyashante are all really wonderful. I just want to say here that we're being quite open to the questions we work with, but the idea is there that power, the discovery. Okay. So here inquiry is multifaceted because awakening and being and reality is multifaceted. So let's be open to all the various questions that could arise questions. We don't even know to ask yet that haven't even arisen yet. And, um, you know, I've been reading through <laughs> very, very slowly the Avan Tamsaka Sutra. If any of you are familiar with that, it is um, considered one of the most epic kind of religious texts in the world, and especially in Buddhism, it is thick, like a thousand pages. It's one of the most classic Mahayana texts, and it is a beast to read. And the first, the first chunk I'm in right now is like all the gathering of all the different beings and, and talking about awakening. And it's just a laundry list of ways all different kinds of beings have awoken. And so there's not one way, even in here, it's just like, oh, this person awoken through this, through that, through this, through that, through this, through that. And uh, literally, like, I don't know if it's like 100 pages of that. So even in the Buddhist tradition, there's this multifaceted awakening. This is the Avatamsaka Sutra. And I'll share that in the, in the, the chat and link in our notes. Um, and uh, when we look at Tibetan Buddhism, numerous deities that embody uh, different enlightened qualities. So another reason why I really personally like to stay open uh, in the possible questions that we can work with. Um, we can also really extend inquiry beyond awakening, classical awakening. So in Buddhist geeks, we talk and have trainings on integral Dharma, and we can talk about waking up, cleaning up, growing up and showing up too much to get into in this uh, context in this video, but in healing and how we are in the world that might not traditionally be seen as waking up, but where we integrate our awakening and life in life, then there are new questions can arise in there that is a, a blend of all of that. So um, for, we can also apply this inquiry to the other ways of meditating. So the questions can take on different flavors. For example, heartful inquiry. The question we work with might feel very heartful or mindful inquiry or embodied inquiry. And particularly for me, I almost am always working with embodied inquiry, and I'll talk about why I think that's really useful. But um, inquiry by itself is really the question, but we can combine it with other ways of meditating. So talk about really multifaceted and multidimensional. Uh, so the questions for this training, before I get into sharing some of my tips about how to practice this, the questions that I honed in on for this training is what is awakening? What is needed? Who am I? What is love? What is this? 
What is meditation? What is surrender? What is enlightened action? What is embodiment? What is emerging? So these are on the site and, and I'll share those with you later. These are just a, a sample. There is a sort of progression there. There, there is covering different flavors of, of questions as well. Um, but these are some that may be interesting or useful for you. And in this moment, one of those questions might have stood out more than the others. So that's important to know. We're going through the question we're working with today may not be that relevant for you today. <laughs> I, I can't know that. But um, there, those are some options for you for your practice. So how to practice inquiry. This is one way, one place to start. So obviously the most simple is just to ask the question. Um, however, see what you think of these and try them on <laughs> in practice and see how the, uh, it shifts your practice. First would be settling just in general, letting mind, body, and heart settle. In Buddhism, we talk a lot about concentration, which is trying to gather up uh, attention and trying to harness, you know, the power of attention, the power of mind. Settling here is not necessarily that, that's just letting like the dust settle, you know, letting the activity, the interactivity in all forms, uh, mental activity, emotional heart activity, and physical body settle to whatever degree is able to settle in this moment. Like just having an opportunity invitation to let things settle. When that settling happens, that means that more of our fullness, more of our full being is available to participate, to voice the question, more of us are available to listen and to be part of that response. So in this sense, you know, you can cultivate settling. That may be something that's really important right now. Like, oh, I'm going to really work with settling mind, body, and heart. And then I'm going to step into a question. Could be that a question helps you settle. The question is what moves things and let them, let things settle. Yeah. So, um, but basically just know, like if we're feeling overwhelmed, just to put it generally broadly, and then we're finding it hard to sit with a question, there can be some compassion there to know like, ah, I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm not feeling settled. So it's okay that this question isn't feeling uh, like the right practice in this moment. But if we have an opportunity to settle, that can be really good first. Now, the next is how I describe it is to disarm the conceptual mind. But it's very important. It is not eliminating or excluding the mind. The mi our mind is part of who we are. There's no need to. So we can say like, oh, I'm in my head. I'm into thinking too much. No, no. Well, that, then how can we include? How can you include more of yourself? And there's a lot of different techniques and approaches to do that. But some way, just wherever we're most concentrated, I usually reference the mind because when we go with a question, a lot of times there's mind stuff going on there, but it could be heart, emotional reactivity, some way to just not let ourselves be condensed in only one part of our being. That's the idea here. So we're not trying to suppress anything. We're not trying to shut anything off, just trying to allow more of us to be present. Now, the one way that I really do that, and people who have done trainings with me know this, is I use the realization process exercises from Judith Blackstone. And the key phrase there is to inhabit the body. Now, this is a whole way of practicing as well. Okay. This is why it's lovely to have multiple ways of meditating. But I will say it doesn't require at all. I always say this even for people who are solely interested in realization process, it doesn't require perfection here at all. Like that, that idea is not even for me very useful for embodiment. But even a little sense of being with the body, being in the body in any degree can be really supportive of the settling of including more of ourselves in the question. I will, this is something I want to introduce in this training a little bit. So we have that as a, as a tool, but you may have other ways in which you find your, find settling and, and uh, inhabit your body. Um, one other thing you can do that's very simple is paying attention to the body in whatever way feels good. Okay. Um, so pay attention to the feet is, commonly a great 
place to go to, even in psychotherapy and psychology, that's often pointed to like, oh, feel your feet touching the ground, outline your feet, you know, mentally, um, contact you're making with your seat or the floor, whatever it is. So we can start very, very simply in that regard. Okay, then we can ask the question. So all of what I just said there can happen like that in a second, or it can be something you could take time with. Coming from a Tibetan a way of practicing, multi-step phasal kind of practice is very normal. So for me, I don't mind like having step one, I'm gonna settle, step two, I'll do this. But you could do it in an instant as well and just say like, settling, letting go. Okay, now I'm ready to ask the question. With asking the question, uh, we'll do it in social meditation. And I encourage you to, to do it out loud, voice it, include the energy of your voice, which naturally includes your body as well in the question by voicing it. Um, and then here's something that I, this will deepen over time for sure. Um, but it's to let the question arise spontaneously out of space, out of being, out of awareness. Now there might be a question again, well, how do you do that? <laughs> I'm just throwing it out there of like, if I guide this one-on-one, -on -one, I can do that. I can just guide a person and then they don't know when I'm going to ask the question. And as soon as I ask it, it is spontaneous for them. And then it allows us to spontaneously listen, spontaneously allow a response to arise. But see if you can find some way of surprising yourself with the question, even though you know you're going to ask it. So I know it sounds a little paradoxical. But the previous steps do support that. It allows it to be more possible to spontaneously ask the question as if you're hearing it for the first time, right? And I mentioned Rilke uh, earlier about living the question. So like that points to that spontaneity as well. Like what does it mean to just let the question permeate and breathe? Then we ask the question, so what happens next? Well, anything could happen. But there is a sense of listening, even if it's for a moment. And again, with, if we're listening naturally, spontaneously, with our, as much fullness as we are able to naturally, there's a listening and a willingness to be surprised. Or uh, not even surprised, because that could be, we can, something could arise and we're not surprised, but the sense of like allowing whatever to arise to, in the response to the question. And then with that, there's a sense of letting whatever arise, arise. It already has, <laughs> that's the thing. It's already arisen. <laughs> um, and there's no need to finalize anything in that moment. So that's what I would encourage in a formal practice. Like, oh, if I'm gonna formally sit, there's starting a clock in time and it's just the question, I don't need to finalize anything in, in that. Even if something is like really striking, I'm still just gonna sit, ask the question, and as I'll mention in a minute, we might be also voicing responses. If something is really meaningful, it'll after the session, it'll be there for sure. Obviously you can adapt this practice. Like there's no right or wrong with this. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sharing more of like a standardized sort of way of going about this. So radical curiosity here is in that spontaneity of the question. The radical curiosity is in that open listening of allowing the, what has arisen to, to just be there, to arise and pass. And then uh, there'll be a coming back into spaciousness, being who knows what, and there'll be a moment where you ask the question again. How, when, why you ask the question, so, I don't know what to say about that, but just there's a motivation that arises and you speak the question, okay? now. Responses. I've also found it helpful to make a few comments that it could be literally anything that arises. I say that because sometimes we might be like searching, we're doing a practice of awakening or the context of awakening inquiry, and we're wanting something profound to arise or illuminating or whatever. And that might happen. It might happen, but it could be amorphous, vague, it could be nonsensical. Insights, thoughts, feelings, sensations, visuals, syllables, don't know, could be nothing. <laughs> that's, what, that's what is the response. Could be any flavor whatsoever. And in terms of, 
I, in terms of something being meaningful, we'll just use that word very broadly. Um, I've asked this question, like, for example, what is needed? And sometimes it's like, when we're really sitting here embodied, uh, it could be sleep. That's what immediately comes up. And it's like, okay, sleep. That's great. Okay. Right. Doesn't need have to be anything more than that. <laughs> and actually, I often share that one of the best instructions I ever got was in the Sogjin retreat that uh, teacher said, if you're tired, sleep. And if you've studied Sogjin or practiced Sogjin, that is a profound instruction. But it can also just be simple to like recover, let your body rest. It doesn't have to be profound. And I, I have found with this, even for people who have been beginners, like in guiding it, there's like a deep trust. Like you can trust your own response. Like not me or somebody else telling you that. Like if it comes up and you feel it arise, not necessarily in all perfection, but just spontaneously, you can trust that. Oh yeah, sleep came up. I trust that. I have to be honest. I, I felt surprised in working sometimes with people who are brand new to meditation, don't have a background and who had that feeling of trust. So it may or may not happen. Again, there's all kinds of things and obstacles we run into with inquiry. So we could be working a lot with trust, working with trust of ourselves, working with trust with asking questions. So um, yeah, this is a practice. So first I would say, try to only voice the question for a little bit to get the practice of just voicing the question and sitting, responses will arise versus also voicing responses at first because a train can get going pretty quickly like in thoughts and stories and narratives. So, but if we just say question and then sit in internal responses will arise, gives us a little bit more better chance to come back to just sitting and asking the question. But then it is good to also go through rounds of question and response, question, response. That's really fascinating and really deeply creative in a certain sense to, because we won't just stop with one answer. Even if it feels really clear, still ask the question, see what happens. So um, we'll be doing this in social meditation, which is really interesting because we can feel each other in inquiry, how, how each of us voices a question. When we do responses, responses will come up. And there's a natural interconnectedness influence that, uh, yeah, it could bring up all kinds of things. It could bring up like, like, wow, I hadn't thought to ask that question or could be uncomfortableness. It could be anything. So that's a little bit different dimension to do that with others as well, but something I really like. Um, so today's question was, what is awakening? And the reason why I wanted to start there is if we're doing kind of like a linear progression over time, this kind of gets a little bit at view in, in meditation and Buddhism. Uh, like, how do we see things? Where do we start? We say reality is like this, even before we practice here are how things are. And so it helps us to feel into both our ideals about awakening, which is why we're going to practice in the first place, but also our direct experiences. There might be direct knowing with that question. So it's just, a, it, it's often a starting place, that question in spiritual paths. So I figured we'd start there. It affects our motivation, how we practice our expectations, our responses to what happened in meditation, how we talk about practice and awakening and experiences. This question leads to a lot. So, um, yeah, I think that's enough. I know it's a lot in, <laughs> I've shared a lot, um, but in practice, we can take anything I've shared a uh, little at a time and let that be the focus of practice. <laughs>